the ocean is facing an existential crisis. Headline news focuses on plastic pollution, but another threat lurks beneath the surface. If you look in the water, there's almost nothing there. Parts of the ocean are dying. These so-called dead zones are starved of oxygen, killing marine life. Fishing communities around the world are suffering the consequences. And the problem starts with chemical pollution on land. It is our responsibility as farmers to make sure that we're not impacting people downstream. Turkey is one of Europe's holiday hotspots. 33 million tourists travel to the country each year. But this year, the sea view from Istanbul looks different. Raw sewage entering the Sea of Mamara has led to a surface of sludge. In Turkey, a slimy floating mass of yellowish white sea slime. Scientists call it mucilage, but many locals know it as sea snot. Sea snot. Sea snot. Sea snot. Sea snot. Sea snot. It's killing wildlife. For fishermen, the filth is fouling their boats and killing their catch. Balıkçıların bu müsilajdan dolayı etkilendiğinde de büyük şehrin vermiş olduğu balıkçılara. For fishermen Imdat and Ibrahim, the sea snot is threatening the only livelihood they've ever known. Aşağı yukarı 60 yıldır balıkçılık yapıyorum. Valla şehirleşme. Ben doğma bime buralıyım bu. Kalamış koyu sapsarı altı kumduk. 25 kuruş atın okurdunuz 5 metre derinlikte. Fakat gelin görün ki bu fikir tepeden ve kurbağal derden akan atıklardan dolayı. Like others in their community, they have been unable to fish. Yani insanlardan zaten kimse denize çıkamadığı için de yapacak hiçbir amaçları kalmadı zaten. Ya biz de öyle mesela biz de şu anda olduğumuz yerde duruyoruz. Şu anda teklemden çıkamıyorum. Neden çıkamadığım için müsilajdan dolayı teklem arıza yaptı. Arıza yaptığı için de şu an denize çıkamıyorum. When he does make it out to sea, his luck doesn't fare much better. <gülüyor> the fishermen know that sewage is only part of the problem. Çünkü denizin içinde oksijen kalmadı. Oksijen kalmayan bir yerde balığın yaşama şansı hiç yok. Gerçekten kendisini tebrik ediyorum. İnşallah da bu çalışmalarını böyle devam et. Sea snot is a symptom of a much bigger threat. The ocean supplies at least half of the Earth's oxygen. When algae photosynthesize, they provide oxygen in the process. But in polluted water, algae can grow out of control, sometimes releasing sea snot. Algal blooms provide food, attracting more fish. And wherever there's a crowd, there's waste. This is decomposed by bacteria at the bottom, a process which uses up a lot of oxygen. To make things worse, the algae eventually dies too, adding even more waste for the bacteria to decompose. This severely reduces oxygen levels in the water, creating desert-like dead zones. the deep south of America, home to the Gulf of Mexico. Here lies the second largest dead zone in the world. To date, more than four million acres have become uninhabitable for most marine life. If you go diving in the water or look in the water, there's almost nothing there. Denise Breitberg has been monitoring the health of the ocean for decades. She leads a group of scientists formed by the UN to tackle the problem of dead zones. 
if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And fish and shellfish and all these animals that we really value depend on oxygen in the water just like we depend on oxygen in the air. This is one of the craziest things I've seen in my life. Just massive amounts of food. For fish unable to flee, the lack of oxygen can prove fatal. Mass fish kills regularly wash up on shores surrounding the Gulf, lining beaches from Florida to Texas. And the problem is spreading. Low oxygen zones in the open ocean have been identified around the world. Since the 1960s, these areas have increased by roughly the size of the European Union. More than 500 low oxygen sites have also been identified in coastal areas. But what's driving this devastation? So nutrient pollution comes from a wide range of human activities. It's fertilizer from our lawns, it's fertilizer from agricultural fields, it's nitrogen produced by power plants and cars, and it's from sewage and septic systems. Here's how it works. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus run off the land into the water. These nutrients feed the algae, creating the very blooms that suffocate the sea. The main cause of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is the huge amount of nitrogen and phosphorus coming down the Mississippi River from as far away as the state of Minnesota. Ben Dwyer is a fourth generation farmer. We got Gertrude and... Gertrude? and Patty. Gertrude and Patty. He lives in rural Minnesota in America's Corn Belt. How's it going? Here, the annual county fair is in full swing. Young lady does a good job, Milton. Let's give all five a really good round of applause for a nice set of students. You did good, bud. That was a really kind of a proud dad moment watching Madison and Sarah show livestock this year. Hey, good job out there. How was that? The farming community out here is really kind of a close knit, really a tight group of people. Um, we all grew up with one another. A lot of us go to the same churches. Our kids go to school together. But farming isn't just the heart of the community here. It's the cornerstone of the economy. Most of our businesses out here are either involved directly with farming or supporting farmers. In Minnesota alone, $112 billion is generated through agriculture, which takes up over half the land. Much of that is for crops to feed livestock. And it's the fertilizer used on these crop farms that winds up in the waters. It does bother me when I see some of the consequences of what we're doing. There's a lot of room for improvement. I think when we look at what's happening down in the Gulf of Mexico, I think it should be obvious to most of us that it's not a sustainable path that we're on. Some 1.9 million tons of nitrogen and more than 220,000 tons of phosphorus end up in the Gulf each year. The algal bloom created by these nutrients appears on satellite imagery each summer. Urban waste from cities is partly to blame, but it's farmland that is the dominant pollutant here, with devastating consequences. Peter Thomas has spent years investigating the impact of dead zones on fish. So we're going to lower the oxygen going into the tanks. His findings sent shockwaves through the scientific community. One way to survive low oxygen is to switch off reproduction. The ovaries and testes from these epoxic sites, as soon as we opened up the fish, we could tell they were much smaller. This is um, a, a very poorly developed ovary, and this is sometimes what we see in the low oxygen zone. The microscope provided further evidence of the harm caused by dead zones. There was a dramatic decrease in the production of viable eggs. Sperm count in male fish dropped too. 
But Peter spotted something even more bizarre. The females showed evidence of masculinization. We found sperm in the ovaries of some of the females. In the Gulf, these intersex changes have led to fewer female fish. All those species that can't reproduce will disappear. This effect will cascade up the food web. And that, of course, will have a huge impact on the ecosystems. But dead zones are not just threatening the marine ecosystem. They contribute to the biggest environmental problem of all, climate change. Since the 1970s, more than 90% of excess heat trapped in the atmosphere has been absorbed by the ocean. This is causing sea temperatures to rise by around 0.13 degrees Celsius per decade. And the problem is accelerating. As global warming heats the ocean, dead zones expand, and that's yet even more bad news for the planet. A big problem is that there's really a vicious cycle here. As oxygen in some parts of the oceans and coastal waters gets to zero or near zero, they then are producing greenhouse gases. Scientists call this the feedback effect of dead zones. When oxygen levels in the water drop really low, bacteria have to look elsewhere for energy, so they turn to nitrogen. The bacteria use up nitrogen, but in the process, a greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide is produced. Eventually, this makes its way to the surface and into the atmosphere, where it contributes to global warming. The ocean produces around a quarter of all nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. While N2O only accounts for around 6% of greenhouse gas emissions, its potency is a real concern for scientists. We know nitrous oxide is laughing gas, but in fact is a really major contributor to global warming that's 300 times as potent as carbon dioxide. Around the world, governments are going to extreme lengths to cleanse the sea. From vacuuming up the sea snot to farming nutrient-absorbing mussels. But tactics like these offer only limited solutions. Removing nutrients from the ocean and coastal waters once they're in the water is really problematic. So really, the solution is to prevent the problem to start with. But how do you convince those upstream to care about what's happening downstream? Come on! Ready for some new grass, guys? <coughs> I know you are. Ben is part of a landmark initiative run by the state of Minnesota. This incentivizes farmers to prevent nutrient runoffs from their land. Here on our farm, we're choosing to do things a little bit differently. Instead of tilling and breaking up the land, Ben plants his seeds directly into the untilled ground. Here, the remains of smaller crops cover and armor the soil. So here we've got a corn, corn crop that we are gonna harvest for grain. There's dead plant material on the ground here, left over from the cover crop from this spring. If rain falls on, on a no-till field, the water is just going to soak in nice and easy. Keeping our nutrients that we've put out here right where they need to be versus a tilled field where it's going to hit the ground, it'll start running down the first hill that it finds and end up in your local waterways. Who do you think a is a better swimmer, swimmer me. between the two of you? Oh, no, it's me. Oh, no. Me. My parents, they live on a lake not too far from here. And my daughters, one of their very favorite pastimes that they have is swimming and playing in the lake. We just wanted to know that we were doing everything on our part. And that requires some cutting edge technology. We'll get those soil tests back, which is what I have in front of me right here. He maps the condition of his soil grid by grid. Synthetic fertilizer is then applied at different rates to match the needs of the soil. And you can see on here, I've got it set at 20 gallons per acre. I can just change this button right there and I'll switch to 15. We'll use the GPS to make sure that we apply it exactly how we need it to be, so we're not over applying, overlapping. As well as avoiding using excess chemical fertilizer, Ben is growing nitrogen-producing plants an environmentally friendly fertilizer. We've been getting between like 40 and 70 pounds of nitrogen out of that red clover. We've been able to reduce our, our fertilizer cost by almost one third. 
we would like to someday get our farm to a point where we are no longer applying synthetic fertilizer, and I do think it's obtainable. Since making these conservation changes, Ben's bottom line is up. Figures show that farmers certified with Minnesota's scheme earn more than those who stick to conventional methods, but old habits die hard. I think one of the biggest holdbacks that people have is there's so much heritage in farming. So many of us grew up with our grandparents and our dads plowing or doing tillage. It's hard to realize that maybe there's a different way. It's a big jump and a leap of faith. So far, only 1.6% of farms in Minnesota have been certified. But these farms have almost halved their combined nitrogen loss and prevented about 220,000 kilograms of phosphorus from entering waterways that wind up in the Gulf. But that's a drop in the polluted ocean. The scale of this problem requires global action across the farming industry and beyond. The consequences, if we don't do anything, are really severe. As the population grows, nutrient pollution is set to increase. Along with global warming, that means more of the ocean will be lost to dead zones. It means that fish will be displaced. Fishing villages dependent on local fisheries may find themselves in real problems. And there are probably problems that we haven't even imagined yet. While the stakes are high, the solution is clear. We really know what needs to be done to curtail land-based pollution. Governments are already making pledges to reduce the burning of fossil fuels, which would limit nitrous oxide in the atmosphere from entering the waterways. But they need to take steps to tackle the biggest culprits of nutrient pollution in the ocean, like banning raw sewage from entering the sea and imposing sweeping changes to decades-old farming practices. Individuals can act too, buying food that is produced sustainably. And you can see at a young age there, when <laughs> I was farming even before I was able to go outside. This is Grandpa. Yeah, there's Grandpa. Mm -hmm. He's in that he one too. so young. <laughs> yeah, we all did. <laughs> you know, we spend a lot of time talking to farmers about conservation practices. We're hoping that if it can catch on, it's gonna impact my daughters. Their kids, you know, generations we don't even know that are coming down the road. We're doing this for them. The world belongs to everybody and we don't want to be the generation to ruin it. We want to be the ones to hopefully turn it around and save it. I'm Kate and I directed this film. The Economist Group has a new multi-year initiative on pollution and ocean health. To find out more, click on the link below. Thanks for watching.